Understanding physics and in this video I'm going to talk about the third assessed practical which is to get a value for little g okay acceleration due to gravity little g now there's a few ways of doing it uh, method one I'm calling this and that's just timing it using a stopwatch what we do is for different heights uh, I've said from one meter to five meters you use a stopwatch to measure the time it takes to fall. Now, one meter, how do you do five meters? Uh, I would get my students out on the stairwell or you could drop the ball from a window. Yes, you can do, use your imagination, get, you know, it's, it's your experiment. You figure out how to do it from one meter to five meters. Use a stopwatch to measure the time it takes to fall. For each height, take at least three measurements and then you're going to calculate a, an average and then what you do is you plot h against i do it by plotting h against a half t squared uh, and then the gradient should be equal to g now why well we have um, s equals ut plus a half a t squared yeah so now u is zero to begin with so s is a half a t squared isn't it now s is the distance so that's h so h is a half g times t squared because g is the acceleration so y equals mx so if you plot h on the y-axis and a half t squared on the x-axis the gradient should be g it's one way of doing it now, there's loads of uncertainty in this, obviously. I mean, basically, for five meters, if you work it out, the time to fall should be about a second. And, and you're only going to be measuring to kind of about plus or minus 0 0.2 seconds. So that's 20% uncertainty. So there's lots of uncertainty here. We can reduce the uncertainty by doing it three times and taking an average. Uh, I would certainly say the person with the stopwatch is the person who lets go of the ball. Yes. Uh, and try and minimize this reaction time thing. Nevertheless, this way of doing it, it does actually give quite a decent answer, but there are better ways of doing it. So method two is we measure the time electronically. Now, I've used this kind of device in the past. So what we have is you've got a metal ball here which is held by an electromagnet uh, and then the ball comes down and it hits this thing at the bottom this little pressure pad or a switch uh, and basically when it lets go of a ball the time starts when it hits the bottom the time stops and so you're measuring the time accurately and so human reaction time doesn't come into it so it's much more accurate yes the timing will be much more accurate however the range of heights that you can do in here will be limited you'll probably get done between uh, 50 centimeters and 100 centimeters notice you've got a little plumb bob there just to make sure that the ball uh, lands in the right place another disadvantage is that you need this equipment to do it there's another method and that's using light gates. Now, what you can have is you've got a, a piece of card uh, and then to get it to fall, I, I sell a tape a, a couple of hundred gram masses to it uh, and use a, a 10 centimeter piece of card. Uh, and then on, on my data loggers, if you tell it that it's 10 centimeters, um, yeah, it'll work out the well, it can actually tell you the acceleration, but you tell it that it's 10 centimeters for the light gates to work out the velocities. Uh, and what you do is you plot V squared minus U squared against 2H. And you're going to get a graph with a gradient of G. Now, why? Because V squared minus U squared equals 2AS, isn't it? Or do you do v squared equals u squared plus 2as? It's the same thing. Okay, so basically, if you plot v squared minus u squared against 2s, the gradient is going to be the acceleration. Again, it's very accurate, 
there's no reaction time involved, um, but a limited range of heights, and you need this equipment, uh, which data loggers aren't cheap. So you've got three methods of doing it. Now, what I would tend to do is I would ask my students to do method one and either method two or method three, probably method one and method two. Uh, and both of those would give a value of G and then you can compare and discuss which which value is more accurate. OK, uh, one good thing about doing it method one is that there's so much uncertainty that when you do your graph, it's a good opportunity to do error bars because you're going to have quite big error bars on the t-axis because there's lots of uncertainty in the value of t, I said maybe 20%, uh, and then you're doubling it. So that's, that's huge uncertainties there. So you can do your line of best fit uh, to get a value of g and then do the, the maximum or the minimum gradient uh, to get the uncertainty in the value of g. These are the techniques which need to be ticked off. Um, just make sure that you discuss the need to take repeats in method one because you're minimizing the effect of random errors. Uh, for the use of ICT now or data logger, if you're not using a data logger, then use of ICT, do correctly formatted tables on Excel. Yes, uh, you can have a go actually doing your graphs on Excel as well. It takes a bit of practice to do decent graphs on Excel, but that would cover the use of ICT. Uh, you should really get to use a data logger at some point in your course. Your, your physics department should have some data loggers.